In this video, we'll be going over two more implications of Cauchy's formula, Moreira's theorem and Liouville's theorem. So first thing we'll talk about is Moreira's theorem. Uh, Moreira's theorem says that if f is continuous on a domain D, and if this integral right here, the integral of f of z dz over this gamma, which I'll define in a second, equals zero for all triangles gamma. So gamma is just any triangle that lies together with its interior inside d, then f is analytic in d. So on the surface value, this seems like a new theorem, but really if we look at it more closely, this is actually just the opposite of Cauchy's theorem. So remember how when we talked about cauchy riemann equations, we talked about how they have a converse. So cauchy riemann equations, the original theorem we talked about said that if some function is analytic on a domain, then cauchy riemann equations are met. But we also talked about a theorem that went the other way, that said if cauchy cauchy riemann equations are met on that domain, uh, then it's analytic on that domain. So this is actually just the converse of Cauchy's theorem. So remember what Cauchy's theorem said? Cauchy's theorem said that if f is analytic in D, um, then we have this is true. We have the integral of f of z dz of gamma equals zero for all closed loops, correct? So a triangle is just one form of closed loop. And the reason we have triangles here is because uh, really all kind of curves can be made of infinitely many triangles. Um, so it, we just have to prove it for triangles and then we proved it for all curves. So this time the conditions are that f has to be continuous, not necessarily analytic yet, uh, has to be continuous on a domain D and all the triangles that lie together with the interior in D, if you take the uh, line integral over that loop, it's gonna be zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to prove this. It's not too bad. So proof, first we let Z0 be an element of D, just like we do in many other proofs. So what I've done here, this green domain here is our domain that we're dealing with, and this point right here in the center of the circle is Z0, which is an element of D. So Z0 is an element of D, and suppose omega is a disk. It's going to be this disk. It's going to be the disk centered at that Z0 with radius R. And what is R? R is going to have some positive number, but it has to be small enough so that that disk lies completely in D. Okay, so we've seen this kind of stuff before, where we have a center, we have a radius, and the radius has to be small enough so this whole disk right here lies completely inside our domain. Okay, so next thing we're going to do, we're going to define a new function, big F. We're going to say big F of Z equals the integral from Z0, which is a fixed point, to some other z, and the only condition on this z is that it should be an element of omega. So it should be inside of this disk. Everything we're going to talk about from now on, we're going to talk about inside of this disk only. We'll talk about how that applies to the whole domain at the end. So that integral of f of w dw, and that's going to be defined as big F of z. And what is the curve here that we're talking about? So the curve is going to be the line joining uh, z naught to z. So if we draw a bigger version of this disk, pretend this is the disk this will be the same disk that's right here, so centered at Z0, and Z, remember, is any point inside here. Then we're going to have the curve is going to be the line segment joining Z0 to Z, and it's going to be oriented that way, going towards Z. Okay, now we're going to suppose H is a small complex number. So you might see where we're going. Whenever we have something defined as a small complex number, we're usually starting to take a derivative. So we're going to have F of Z plus H minus F of Z. And what is that equal to? Well, F of Z plus H, if we plug in Z plus H right here, we're going to get integral of Z naught to Z plus H minus F of Z. So minus integral from Z naught to Z. So this seems like kind of we can't work with this right now. But what we're going to do, the easiest way to look at this we're going to look at it uh, through this, this orange text right here. So I've kind of drawn that circle again. This is omega again, that disk. And here's centered at Z0, here's Z. And we said Z plus H is a small complex number. So small means that it's small enough so that Z plus H, Z plus H is still inside this disk. Okay, so here's Z plus H, here's Z, here's Z0. Okay, so now since this is a triangle, in the domain, right? This is a triangle inside omega, and omega is inside the domain. Therefore, this is a triangle inside the domain. Then, by the uh, by the conditions of Moreira's theorem, it says that all triangles have line integral zero when you go around them. So that means that if we take the uh, closed loop integral around this triangle, and it's composed of three parts, right? The first part is z naught to z which we have right here. Next part is z to z plus h, which is right here, and the last part is z plus h back to z naught, our starting point. So if we add this, 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 all the integrals are equal to zero. So now we can kind of reform this. Suppose we want to isolate this part right here. We just want to isolate this integral right here, and we'll move the other two to the other side and make them negative. So we're left with negative z naught to z, which is this in the negative form. And this has a plus, but the only reason it has a plus is because when I moved this integral right here, 
over to the negative side, I just flipped the uh, order of integration, which is equivalent to just flipping the direction in which you go. So the original direction was z plus h to z naught. Now the direction is what's given by this orange arrow right here. It's going to be from z naught to z plus h. So now this is a new way of saying it. We have integral of z to z plus h equals integral of z naught to z plus h minus integral of z naught to z. But what do we know about this? right here. Let's take a little look at the previous side of the paper. So remember, it's going to be z naught to z plus h minus z naught to z. That's exactly what we, what we have here. We have z naught to z plus h minus z naught to z. So that means this is going to be exactly equal to what we have right here. The integral from z to z plus h. So now we're going to go down here knowing that this is what uh, this is really what uh, f of z plus h minus f of z is equal to. And then we're going to just transform this into a differentiation problem so we can find a good derivative in the end. So we're going to have, this is what we had. We have f of z plus h minus f of z. Now we're going to divide that all by h, and we're going to subtract small f of z. This is something we've seen in a previous theorem proof. So now how does that affect the integral side? Well, now it's still the limits from z to z plus h, and we're going to have f of w minus f of z over h dw. So now you're asking, how did this f of z get incorporated inside this integral? Well, that's because integral of... of uh, negative f of z over h of from z to z plus h is equal to negative f of z. And the reason for that is f of z and h are constants, so we can just take them out. In fact, we can even take this negative sign out. And then all we're left with is just the integral uh, of 1 from z to z plus h, which is just h. So that h multiplied by that h gives us negative f of z, just as we see here. So we've seen this technique in a previous proof as well. So now, the last thing to do is just take some, uh, we're going to use epsilon delta to finish this off. We're going to have now, given epsilon is greater than 0, so choose a delta small enough so that this modulus, the, the modulus of f of w minus f of z, is less than epsilon. And remember, this is all taking place inside that disk omega. So that this modulus is less than epsilon when the modulus of w minus z is less than delta. Okay, so this is um, all taking place inside this disk right here we see. Uh, we're going to, basically we're playing the epsilon delta game. We're saying, give me any epsilon. Um, tell me how close you want me to get to f of z. So we have f of z here. It says, tell me how close you want me to get to that f of z. Uh, and then I can do that by um, getting close enough to z uh, with any anything inside this circle. Okay, so then if we have, now th this is an important step as well. If we have the modulus of h is less than delta, this is important. We'll see why in just a second. Then now we're going to use the integral estimation formula that we saw in the video on line and girls greens theorem. So what we're going to do, we're going to have the modulus of this entire integral right here. Notice this integral is just this integral without the h. We'll incorporate that in just a second. But we're going to take this integral. This is going to be estimated by the maximum value of f of w minus f of z. And what's the maximum value of the modulus of that? Well, it's given blatantly right here. It's epsilon. So we're going to have epsilon, and then uh, we're going to have the the uh, the length of the curve. So what's the length of the curve from z to z plus h? Well, it's just simply going to be modulus of h, because it's just the difference. So we're going to have that. So now we're going to incorporate this entire integral. This entire integral is only different from this integral by having a denominator of h. So when we take the modulus of that, this modulus h comes out on the bottom, and just cancels that with this modulus h. So this is just less than or equal to epsilon, which means that since this integral modulus right here is equivalent to taking this whole thing modulus right here, we're going to have that that whole thing modulus is just less than or equal to epsilon as well, since this and this are equal. Okay, so now the last, last step is to let epsilon approach zero. So as epsilon approaches zero, then we're going to have, then this condition is going to get more and more tight. We're going to have to get this is going to get closer and closer and closer to f of z. So that means we're going to have to get w closer and closer and closer to z, which means that delta will have to approach 0. So by letting epsilon approach 0, delta approaches 0. But what else did we say? We said that delta is always greater than modulus h. But if this is approaching 0, modulus h being less than it must also approach 0. And if modulus h approaches 0, h approaches 0. So look at that whole chain, make sure that makes sense. And, um, and then the last thing we'll do is we're going to say, so after all that, the limit as h approaches 0, really it's the limit as epsilon approaches 0, but that implies that h approaches 0, of this f of z plus h minus f of z over h equals f of z. And the reason for that is because that means that the uh, limit of this thing inside the modulus approaches 0, and then if we just move the f of z to the other side, we'll get this statement that's right here. Okay, so what does this mean? This is just the definition of the derivative. So if we take the derivative of big F of z, we get small f of z. That's all this is saying right here.
And now the punchline here is that since big F of Z is analytic, how do we know it's analytic? We just found out that it has a derivative, um, which is equal to F of Z, which is continuous. Um, then since it's analytic in omega, then its derivative is also analytic in omega. And why do we know that? We know that from the previous video, because we said if something is analytic on a domain, it has a power series in that domain. And power series are always infinitely differentiable. So that means that if this is analytic, then f of z is analytic on that domain. And that's all we were trying to prove, right? We were trying to prove that f is analytic in d. And in fact, what we proved so far is that f is analytic in omega, but we can just do the same thing, because if f is analytic in omega, we can choose a new uh, we can choose a new z-naught, just choose a point that's kind of far away from the original z-naught and make a new circle, right? We can make a new circle, I'll put in here an orange, and then we can repeat this process and find that it's analytic inside this disk. And then we just do that all over the domain, we can cover the entire domain in that fashion. So the last uh, theorem we'll talk about is Louisville's theorem. This is a pretty profound theorem. So it says that if f is entire, remember that means that it's analytic on the entire complex plane, and there exists a constant m such that the modulus of f of z is always less than or equal to m for all z. So let's just consider so far what this is saying. Uh, our domain is now the entire complex plane, since it's going to be entire on the en entire complex plane. Um, we are saying that there's always a constant such that the modulus of f of z is less than that constant. Okay, so that means that you can take, we can we can have all these z's, right? And if you evaluate big F at any point, let's say this point z1, if you take F of z1 and then you take the modulus, it's always going to be less than or equal to some constant m. So it can't exceed that. Then, the uh, what this conclusion is, it says that big F of z is identically equal to c. If you haven't seen this triple bar right here, it means identically equal to, which means always equal to. So big F of z is identically equal to c, where c is a constant. So that means that if this is true, if we can have, uh, if there's a maximum value for the modulus of uh, F of z, then that means that f of z is a constant on the entire complex plane. That means that no matter where you evaluate it, it's going to be the same number, which is pretty weird. It doesn't make logical sense. But let's try to put some sense into it um, pretty quickly. So now we're going to define a new function again. We're going to have g of z equals big F of z minus big F of 0 over z. Notice that g is entire. Uh, you might be thinking it's not, because if you plug in 0 here, you have a 0 denominator. But really, what is g of 0? It's going to be defined by limit as z approaches 0 of this g right here. And now what does that equal to? Since we, when we put in f of 0 minus f of 0, we get 0 numerator and 0 denominator. So we have to use L'Hopital's rule. So when we do take the derivative of the top and bottom, we just have limit as z approaches 0 of f prime of z, which is just f prime of 0. So that means that g of 0 equals f prime of 0, and there's really no problem. The only time you have a problem is when you have a 0 denominator and not a 0 numerator. Okay, so we avoided the problem here. Next thing we're going to do, we're going to suppose that modulus of z is equal to r. So we're restricting our t attention to only uh, numbers z such that the modulus of them equals r. And what do we know about that? That means that they all lie on this circle centered at 0 with radius r. Okay, so they're all z's only on this orange circle, the outside of it right here. So what do we know about uh, z's that are on a circle? We can parametrize them. We can write them as z equals r e to the i theta for some theta, right? So z equals r e to the i theta for some theta. We learned about that in the parameterization video. That means if we take the modulus of all these different z's, that means the modulus of z, uh, g of, and this is just z, I just replaced it with its form parametrized, is less than or equal to, and now this is uh, something interesting to note. So basically what we're doing, we're just taking the modulus of this g right here, and now notice we can split this modulus as modulus numerator over modulus denominator. What's the modulus of the denominator? Well, that's just modulus z, which is given as r, which is why this is r. Now, notice something about complex numbers, which we might have talked about before. Let's say you have some complex number right here, and then you have another complex number right here, right? So one thing you can do is take the sum of their moduli. So that's going to be basically this distance plus this distance. Now, how does that relate to the distance between them? So if we add these complex numbers together, we're going to get this, kind of like a, a hypotenuse if this was a right angle, but we're going to get this sum. So how does this sums modulus compare to the individual sum of the moduli? Well, by what we know about geometry, we know that the sum of two legs is always more than the sum of the third leg, which simply tells us that if let's say our complex numbers were z1 and z2, then we know that 
the modulus of z1 plus modulus of z2 is going to be greater than or equal to the modulus of z1 plus z2. And this is just an algebraic form of what we know about this from the triangle inequality. Okay, so using that same logic, we are going to split up f of z and negative f of uh, 0, which are like two complex numbers. We're going to split them up into modulus f of z, which is just our e to the i theta, plus modulus of f of z. Uh, f of 0, okay? And that's going to be over r because modulus of z equals r. Now, what do we know about this? This is less than or equal to, and this r stays, and since this is some modulus of f evaluated at some point, it's going to have to be less than or equal to m because we know that from the conditions of this uh, Liouville stone. So that means this is less than or equal to m, this is less than or equal to m, that means together they're less than or equal to 2m. So we have less than or equal to 2m over r. Now let's just finish up. Um, so now we're going to say, suppose W is a point of the plane, just any any point, okay? And assume R is big enough so that R is greater than modulus W. So remember, we never really put a restriction for R. We just said it's that it's it's some circle. It can be as big as we want, because since our domain is a complex plane, we can just go infinitely. So pretend we have some W. Here it is. And it has a modulus, right? The modulus is the length of the segment. We're just going to pretend our R is so big that it contains W, just like that. Okay, so here's our R for example. So once we have that taken care of, uh, we're going to do an application of Cauchy's formula again. We're going to say g of w equals 1 over 2 pi i integral of uh, over this curve. It's going to be over the circle um, that we have right here of g of z over z minus w dz. Okay, so remember, what were the conditions for Cauchy's formula? For Cauchy's formula, we said that f has to be uh, analytic on the domain. And is f analytic on the domain? Well, it's entire, which is even better. It's analytic on the entire complex plane. So that's definitely met. So we're allowed to use Cauchy's formula uh, right here. So Cauchy's formula uh, gives us this 1 over 2 pi i, and this gives us this uh, function expressed as an integral right here. Okay, so now what we're going to do, we're going to try to estimate this integral using our estimation formula. So we're kind of using everything in this uh, proof right here. We're going to find uh, modulus of g of w is equal to modulus of this right here that we found, this integral with the 2 pi i. And that has to be less than or equal to what? So this 1 over 2 pi i, when you take the modulus, this i disappears, right? So we're going to have 1 over 2 pi maximum of the inside, maximum of g of z over z minus w on the curve in question. The curve in question I've just uh, given as gamma, but really gamma is that circle right there with radius r. And that's all times the length of gamma. And that should be easy because we know the length of the circumference of a circle pretty easily. So that's less than or equal to 1 over 2 pi, which is just this 1 over 2 pi, times 2 pi r, which is the length of that circle because the circumference is 2 pi radius, so it's going to be 2 pi r, uh, times maximum of this again, and z has to be on that circle. So now let's analyze this really fast. Let's look at how do we find the maximum of this modulus right here? Well, we can do so by finding the maximum of the numerator and the minimum of the denominator. And by doing that, we'll find the maximum of the fraction. So what's the maximum of the numerator? Well, we did on the previous side of this paper, maximum of g of z when z is on the circle is simply going to be 2m over r. So that's simply going to be 2m over r. What's the minimum of this denominator? Well, that takes a little bit more work, but not too bad. So notice that uh, z, I've drawn a little, I've drawn again the circle. So w is somewhere inside the circle. Z is always on the outside. And how do we find the minimum value of modulus z minus w? Well, pretend we chose a z all the way over here. What would z minus w be? So z would be like this, and w would be like this. So z minus w would be... Uh, roughly something like this and that would be pretty big right but if we want to if we want to reduce this as much as possible what we're going to do is let's just say w is here for a second we're going to want to choose the z so that it goes directly on this radius so z right there it just follows the radius from the origin to w to z it's all lying on one straight line because by doing that then we're just dealing with this line segment right here so this i i've drawn the uh perpendicular between it is going to be the minimum value of z minus w. So just convince yourself of that. If you choose any other z, anything else other than that minimum right there, then you're going to take z minus w. You're going to have z minus w, and you're going to have a much bigger uh, line segment to deal with. Okay, so that means that the minimum is going to be that segment. And what is the length of that? Well, it's going to be the complete r, and you're going to have to subtract the length of w. So it's going to be r minus modulus w. So we have r minus modulus w right there, and that's the minimum. So we're just going to plug all that in. So we have 1 over 2 pi from there. We have 2 pi r from here. We have 2m over r because that's the maximum of, 
of modulus g of z and we have a uh, minimum of 1 over we have the minimum of z minus w modulus which is what we said is 1 over r minus modulus w so we have lots of nice cancellations cancellations we have 2 pi 2 pi r r so we're just left with less than or equal to 2m over r minus modulus w and now again let me bring up the point that we never put a specification for r r can be as big as we want and this will still have to hold so let's pretend we set r goes to infinity right so now m is fixed, w is fixed. As r goes to infinity, this denominator gets huge, it gets super huge, and then the numerator is just nothing in comparison, so this goes to zero as r approaches infinity. So that means that what approaches zero? What we were dealing with in the very beginning, that means modulus of g of w approaches zero, which means that since modulus can never be a negative number, g of, z g of w must go to zero. So that means that g of w equals zero, and g of w was what? In the very beginning, we defined it as f of z minus f of zero over z. So that means that f of z minus f of 0 over z, z equals 0. And then the z, we can just multiply by 0. So all we're left with is f of z minus f of 0 equals 0. So that means that f of z equals f of 0 for all z. And we're done. And let's just make a quick note. That's because we just proved that for any z you want, you can have, and you plug it into f of z, it's always going to be f of 0, which means that no matter which z you pick, it's always going to be equal to a constant. And what's that constant? Well, it's going to be f of 0. Really, it's going to be f of anything, but we just use f of 0 for this proof. So this proves Liouville's theorem, and this is going to be useful later on because it's going to let us make big implications about a domain just by knowing a little piece of information, which is something great about complex analysis in general.